Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio. I am Dr. Jake Porter, your host. We have a very powerful conversation today, one that I want to begin right away with a trigger warning. Today's topic will be about domestic violence and the relationship between domestic violence, sex addiction, and betrayal. Um, It is very intense at times. Uh, The information is hard to hear at times. Um, It's emotional. And so I want to strongly, strongly encourage all of you who are listening to do what you need to do to take good care of yourself. Uh, If that means pausing, pause. If that means stopping the episode, stop the episode. Um, Because you, you, you don't want to, to put yourself in a position of um, re-traumatizing yourself uh, through, through the information that will be heard at the same time. It is uh, incredibly transformative to know this information, to understand this information, particularly if it is a part of your story. And so if you are in a place where you feel you have the internal resources and the external support network to look at this issue, um, I'm excited for you. As hard as it may be, I'm excited because, as we've heard before, knowledge is power. And sometimes the ability to name our experiences, to put labels to our experiences, to see that it's not a one-off. It's not something that just happened to you, but this is a real phenomenon that happens to many betrayed partners that can be validating and empowering, and that can lead to steps for change and healing. That is my hope for you. My partner in this conversation is Lisa Taylor. Lisa joined me some months ago when I hosted a free online summit called Navigating the Depths. Um, And it was a summit that focused on sex addiction and betrayal trauma with other co-occurring issues. And the co-occurring issue that I spoke about with Lisa is domestic violence. Lisa holds a Master of Counseling. She is an APSAT certified, clinical certified uh, partner coach. She is a partner trauma and sex addiction counselor living in New Zealand. She runs an online community blog for wives of sex addicts at beyondbetrayal.community. She recently completed her master's research at the University of Auckland on the prevalence of domestic violence in the lives of partners of sex addicts. It's such important work, as you will hear in our conversation. Most of her client work is conducted online through the UK-based counseling and coaching agency Naked Truth Recovery, which serves men and women around the world who are looking to get free from porn and sex addiction or heal from betrayal trauma. Lisa is a phenomenal human being. Um, I am grateful to count her as my friend, and I am so excited to bring you this conversation with all the potential power for healing and change that it has. Before we uh, turn our attention there to um, to that conversation with Lisa, I do want to let you know about a few things coming up with AppSats. Uh, AppSats is hosting its foundational training, the Multidimensional Partner Trauma Model Training. Two offerings of that coming up, November 14th through 17th, so just a few weeks away. And then again in January, January 22nd through 25th. These are all conducted Uh, live via Zoom. If you work with betrayal trauma, if you work with sex addiction, and you have never taken this training, you really need to do this. This is a wonderful training to help you orient yourself to um, a, a good understanding of betrayal as an experience of trauma. 
And so whether you're a coach, you're a clinician, and if you work in this area or you want to begin working in this area, please go to appsats.org. That's A-P-S-A-T-S dot O-R-G and learn more about the multidimensional partner trauma model training. Also, important announcement. I've been announcing on this uh, podcast the upcoming AppSats conference, which was scheduled for early November. We have postponed that conference, and uh, but we are still very excited to be offering it to you in the first quarter of next year. So it is now not the 2023, but the 2024 AppSats conference. It will be conducted January 31st through February 2nd. There will be many uh, speakers who are a part of the conference. I'll be speaking. And so will Lisa, who will be speaking further, going to a lot more depth than what you will hear in this conversation. So if you get a lot out of this conversation with Lisa and you want more, uh, please join us for that upcoming conference um, in January, early February of next year. Again, you can go to appsats.org to learn about that. One more announcement that I want to make. I am really excited. I'm going to re be restarting something that I have not done in several years since the pre-pandemic world. In 2024, I'm going to bring back my Daring Way uh, retreats. I'm a certified Daring Way facilitator. The Daring Way is the model uh, based on the research of Dr. Brene Brown, another Houstonian, a fellow Houstonian with me. And um, I'm trained in her, her methodology and her uh, work. And I'm going to be offering four opportunities for Daring Way retreats, two for men, two for women. So there will be uh, gender specific, two for men, two for women. One will utilize, one for each, men and women will utilize the work from her book, Daring Greatly, and that research that went along with it. And the other, one for men, one for women, will utilize the work from Rising Strong. De uh, Brene Brown's work on dealing with shame, on overcoming emotions that we get hooked by, not overcoming them really, but actually learning, learning to befriend them and use them for our good, learning to own your own story, to take control of your narrative, to rise up after you've been knocked down. It's really phenomenal material, phenomenal content. This will be a very small group experience. You will stay at a home that is owned by my wife and me. Um, we will host you there. It will be limited to eight men or eight women at a time. If you want to learn more about that, the link will be in the show notes, or you can go to drjakeporter.com slash daringway2024. Uh, again, limited spots. There are already uh, registrations are already coming in. So if that interests you, go check out the dates, learn more about it there, drjakeporter.com slash daringway2024. And you will um, you you can sign up there. All right. I don't want to wait any longer. I want to turn our attention now to this conversation with Lisa Taylor on the relationship between domestic violence, sex addiction and betrayal. Welcome to this session of the Navigating the Depths Summit. I'm joined in this session by Lisa Taylor, who is a partner trauma and sex addiction counselor living in New Zealand. She serves on the board of sex addiction specialist Arteroa, something like that. Did I get close, Lisa? And, uh, and she runs an online community blog for um, wives of sex addicts at beyondbetrayal.community. Lisa recently completed her master's research at the University of Auckland on the prevalence of domestic violence in the lives of partners of sex addicts. Most of her client work is conducted online through the UK-based counseling and coaching agency, Naked Truth Recovery, which serves men and women around the world who are looking to get free from porn and sexual addiction or heal from betrayal trauma. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us for this summit. You're welcome, Jake. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel honored to be doing this well, with you. And I feel honored uh, that, that you're joining us when the moment that we settled on what our theme would be, uh, the theme of co-occurring disorders, I immediately said to myself, I've, I've got to invite Lisa to be a part of it. 
because I just, mm. I so respect you, the work you do and um, the research that you've been doing. So really looking forward to getting into this uh, with you. I do want awesome. to just mention as we're starting this conversation, uh, a bit of a warning for our listeners um, that I know that this particular subject of domestic violence can be uh, difficult, challenging, triggering, and I, I just want to vocalize support for those who are um, uh, joining us for this session to take care of themselves and uh, feel free to hit pause or walk away. Um, uh, w- number one, we won't know. And number two, even if we did, we would applaud you and not take offense. I know Lisa feels the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, Lisa, thanks, a couple thanks. of years I may, ago, I may give a few yes. warnings. Yes, please, I may give a few ahead. warnings just as more, more triggering content comes up. I might just say, hey, check and check in on yourself. And, you know, this might be a spot that's a bit tougher right mm. now. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lisa. Yeah. So a, a few years ago, you launched a study on domestic violence in the lives of partners of sex addicts. I'm curious how you got interested in this topic to begin with. Yeah, actually, strangely, I've had some interest in this topic um, going back to my to my own childhood and going back to my own childhood, mm. growing up with somebody with sex addiction. And I think even as a teenager, I was wondering, are these things related? Like, are these things that, that I'm seeing now? Or is, could there be a relationship? And then uh, when I began to do this work, which, you know, was after, you know, my own journey as, as a partner of a sex addict, uh, twice, actually, um, mm. I started to see it coming up a lot in the work. And I, that question came back to me, is there a relationship here? So I, I spoke to colleagues and they were seeing it too. I can recall talking to Barb Steffens, who's been over 20 years doing this work. And she had worked in the domestic violence field um, previous to getting into this work. And so she was also seeing it and noticing it a lot. And she was saying, yes, I think she said, Lisa, we're all seeing it, but there's no studies right now wow um to show that there's an association we could really use some research on this and so the researcher and me went i think i'm going to research that <laughs> so that's how i that's how i got interested that's that's so wonderful and it is such an important thing you know i just I just want to say for any of our listeners the the importance of research this is how funding happens. This is how we develop, you know, better understanding of these issues to develop effective treatments and knowing what works and what doesn't work. And so, Lisa, thank you for beginning to fill that gap. So you did this study and I'm curious now, what are the findings? What did you turn up regarding the prevalence of domestic violence for partners of sex addicts? Okay, so I'll start by telling you a little bit about this idea of prevalence, right? In order to to understand prevalence, you need, you know, um, a body of individuals and you need to have a body of individuals, you know, hopefully a relatively large body when when the domestic violence uh, fields like um, like the World Health Organization wants to understand prevalence, they will go and do and talk to the general population right and they will they will pick little um the kind of random sample they call it they're going to randomly sample the population now part uh, th- this was on female partners of sex addicts they had to be heterosexual they had to be still in relationship that's not a big group you'd find in the general population of people so i had to kind of try and find a general population of partners of sex addicts and so I advertised and I said to people, whether you feel that domestic violence is part of your story or not, please understand we're trying to understand prevalence. So we want to hear from everybody who qualifies. And so over 700 people engaged with the wow. study, which is which is pretty good because yes. you know I can't I can't get out there to everybody. Now. Um, a bunch of those people, unfortunately, did not qualify because they were no longer with, and that was one of the, you know, needed things. They had to be, you know, 18 years of age and over. And I also asked that they would be seeing someone for support. Mm. That's a, that's because of the ethicalness. I mean, we wanted to make this an ethical study. Universities 
are big yes. on ethical studies. These women could not be talking about such things and then not have support after to turn to. So that narrowed it down to the point where 558 women, which is still a good number, you know, um, were able to complete the whole study. And of those 558 women, we found out that 92% of them had experienced some form of domestic violence with the sex addict partner at some point in the relationship. And wow. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a bit of a mind blower. Mm. Um, 58% of them had experienced that partic those particularly injurious forms of violence that we call physical and or sexual violence. And we found that for 48% of them, that violence was what we was what the World Health Organization categorizes as severe violence. So wow. that's that's pretty significant. And 21% of the women had um, who had children who participated said that their children were also experiencing violence or had experienced violence at the hands of the sex addict partner. So wow. those are some big numbers. Those are yeah. staggering numbers. I actually. My my reaction there was not um, was not an act. Those are staggering yeah. numbers. How does that compare to uh, domestic ex um, domestic violence experiences for women in general? Yeah. So we have some ideas of the prevalence in the general population because of uh, certain countries, like for example, in the United States, you guys have the you have the CDC who's gathered statistics, but um, the World Health Organization kind of put together a bunch of these, grabbed these national studies, and they had already done their own, what they call multi-country study, which is, it's the study that my study is based off of. So it's important that I say that because I'm going to give yes. you the comparison and you have to know I'm not talking apples versus oranges here. Right. I am talking apples versus apples because the study questions I asked how domestic violence was defined um, was what the who used in their multi-country study. So wow. the exact same questions, except that they looked at it for all of your partners through all of your lifespan. And I just looked at it for your most recent um, or current sex addict partner. So in some ways their numbers should be higher, right? Because it, that's a broader net to cast than the one I cast. Yes. And asking the same questions I asked a few, um, they asked about uh, violence and pregnancy. I didn't ask that. Otherwise they are the same questions minus a couple little tweaks to wording, but it's about the physical and sexual violence, which we're gonna particularly compare because that's where most of the research is. Um, those are the exact same questions, except we defined choking a little bit more. We did, we we brought we were more specific with women because sometimes there's a specific image and women don't understand it's it's actually just about restriction of airflow. So otherwise, the same questions: apples versus apples. So what what did they find? What's in the general population? Well, in uh, throughout the entire globe. All, all of the first world, second, third world nations, however you want to see those Western, non-Western nations, that's for physical and sexual violence, it's about 30%. And if you look at the first world nations, which for the, what they call the high income nations, which is all but three of these 558 women were from high income nations, the normal background noise of domestic violence is 23% is that prevalence, right? Wow. So 23% versus our group of women, these partners of sex addicts who were looking at 58% apples wow. versus apples. That is staggering. That is amazing. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'm so glad you did speak to how you base your study on the world health organizations. Cause the, the researcher in me was kind of wondering, yeah. okay, you but know, what what, how, how do you compare that? Yeah, exactly. Or how do we know we're talking about the same thing? So how in, in both of these studies, both the world health organization, whose and uh, yours, how do you define domestic violence? What are we talking about here? Yeah, well, I'm going to I'm going to just give you um, I'm going to share my screen because we practice this ahead of time. So we know I can do it. Um, I'll say in general that people when they think domestic violence, they are thinking things like hitting right and, and punching. But domestic violence is actually much more broad. It's, it's a much broader idea than most people realize. So as a counselor. When I'm listening for domestic violence, I'm going to use a tool like this. And this is out of actually Duluth, Minnesota. So this is actually mm -hmm. an American-based tool. 
it's called the Duluth uh, Power and Control Wheel, right? And so I think it's important that people realize that that domestic violence is about an ongoing pattern of power and control, right? Where the person with the power is trying to keep themselves in that position of power in order to get what they want, generally to the detriment, right, of the person who's lacking power. Um, in this wheel, you'll see that it's kind of the domestic violence is defined by certain acts. And similarly, in my, I'm gonna just swap that for this here, and I don't know if that's how, oh, isn't that cool because that doesn't want to share now. Um, I'm going to show you in a second the actual, what they call in a study, the measures, um, which which is another way of, fancy way of saying the questions. Yeah, if I stop it and make it go again, it'll show you that were used. Um, we had questions about um, physical violence, questions about sexual violence, questions about emotional abuse, and questions about controlling behavior. These are, it says here, you know, who's violence against women measures. So these are the measures that were used in this study. Like I said, with one change to word, uh, to the wording choked was just expanded mm. out slightly. Otherwise, wow. it's the same. So that's what we were looking at for this study. We wanted to understand. And, and I think it's important to, to also know, because who says this in their study as well, these are not all the measures in the world of domestic violence. It's like, oh, but I have this other really horrible experience of power over me um, to my detriment that's not in this list. Domestic violence researchers are never trying to hit all the possible forms of abuse. They are just casting a net broad enough that they're probably going, you're probably gonna fall somewhere in here if you are experiencing domestic violence, but it's not an all-inclusive list. So. That's the kind of, these are the kinds of questions that, that we were looking at for this study. Wow. And keep that up Stop there that. for a moment. Well, actually, if you can okay. leave, leave okay. it up there yeah. for just a yeah, second, because I, I do want to, I want to <laughs> make sure people don't gloss over this because I think it's so important to have a more expansive understanding of, of right. what we're talking. We're not merely talking about, well, I've never hit her. Right. And, um, and I know everybody, you know, most, most folks out there can read, but I think it's so important to look at a few of these and I just, uh, you know, my eyes are, are being drawn to some that I know I've dealt with it here in my office. So yeah. just by way of, you know, anecdotal validation, mm -hmm. um, as well, f physically forced to have sexual intercourse when she didn't want to. She yeah. said, no, she's no, no. But then, oh, you know, giving in. Well, yeah. What, what is that? Uh, after yeah. a series of no's after one, no, um, the belittling, the humiliation, and then also, and maybe this was on the wheel, um, the use of male privilege. And yes. I, I know I, I'm, I know I'm deviating from our, our script a little bit, Lisa, but I know you can also take it. <laughs> Can, can you talk a little bit about that, um, about male privilege and, and, and its relationship to power and, and violence? Yeah. Um, and that's something I literally, it's early in the morning and I've already had conversations about this today, right? Wow. It, it is something that we have to talk about a lot. Well, the one I was talking about today was, uh, was financial abuse where mm. I decide how the money will be spent. You are on an allowance. You do not have access to some of our accounts, right? Because I'm the head of the household and I will make those decisions. Um, male and male entitlement may mean as well that where I, I value the work I do um, above the work you do. Um, you may be at home caring for children and, uh, but that is belittled and you are told that that's, that's your expected job, but it is not a value and you don't have choices about that. You must, do that kind of job. Um, male entitlement may be as well, you have to be out working and do all the housework, you know, because I, I don't engage in that kind of thing or childcare because that's a woman's role. So where, where it's kind of, uh, I'm adhering to male heterosexual norms and saying that these are the standards by which we must live uh, to your detriment. 
um, mm -hmm. that would be a good way of de defining that. And some of that came under what the, con the controlling behaviors here. Yes. Um, yeah. And interestingly, those are measured in the present tense. Everything else, and again, this was the way the who did it, um, they measured on the lifetime. Like, you know, do you have any experiences, experience of these over your life? Now we check over mm -hmm. your life, then we check current. Current violence is considered to have happened in the last year. So 26% of these women who had physical sexual violence that had it happen in the last year, that means we would say mm -hmm. it is current violence, not lifetime prevalence. Again, which is a shocking figure, right? So this is stuff that's going on for women right now. Um, this is this is partly how we measure it. Interesting as well that you picked up on the sexual violence. So in almost any other study that you look at um, around the world, physical violence is more common than sexual violence in women's lives. It is more commonly experienced. But for partners of sex addicts, it was the other way around. Wow. For partners of sex of sex addicts. It was the sexual violence that was at a, at a noticeably higher rate. Uh, and the one that I thought would come out top was not the one that it did. The one that was mm -hmm. most frequently experienced by women was this last one, which was forced to do something sexual that she found degrading or humiliating. I, I can't yes. remember off the top of my head and I didn't write it down, but a, a really large number of our participants. Wow like over 50% or around that 50% yeah. mark is coming to mind, had experienced that. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So this, are, mm. this is some of what was I, I discovered in doing this research. Thank you. And thank you for keeping that up. I appreciate that. Um, You're welcome. Wow. That is, that is uh, amazing to, to think about. Um, so as you, as you did your research and, you know, you, you got a pretty clear glimpse of prevalence. How about discovering any um, factors that may accompany this these behaviors that either make the violence worse or better within these coupleships? Yeah, no, that was something I wanted to know about, too. Like a prevalence study, um, you know, is, is one thing and it's, it's big enough. But I thought while I'm gathering this data and while I'm talking to these women, I really would like to know what's associated with the violence, right? And there are ways to measure associations. And so one of the things I thought I would do, and and I'm gonna say right now, I'm going to talk now about specific acts uh, of, of sexual acting out. And that may be difficult and triggering for people. Thank you. I'm gonna show a chart on that. I, and I, I know none of this is particularly easy to hear, especially if this is your experience. And, and please do be taking care of yourself. And, and consider getting ready with that pause button right now and remember what your tools are to take care of yourself if you need that. Thank you. So I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna just share the, this screen because I, I met my, my husband who is amazing. Um, oh, that's, I think that's, no, I think this is the one. Interesting how it's picking up different things. This is a really smart program my friend here has found. <laughs> um, this is a little, it's, it's called a matrix, right? And in this little this diagram you've got on up here on this axis, it says acts of violence. So these are the acts of physical and sexual violence that were measured. Mm -hmm. And here it says acting out behaviors. Um, and I've got, some of these are short form because it's actually on the, on the study said internet porn, <clears throat> other sexualized media, sex worker, cyber sex, phone sex. Now what is up with these colored squares here? is that we're talking about statistical association. So what's in dark green is what's called a highly statistically significant association, which is another way of saying this is not by chance, right? We're looking at the pattern and saying it's not an accident, right? The way these are being answered. And these are still, these are still what they call statistically significant associations in the lighter green probably almost undoubtedly not by chance whereas opposed to absolutely not by chance right that there's an association here so one of the first things that i w and i was curious about this i asked about some of the offending behaviors stalking exhibitionism uh, voyeurism and these came up as absolutely strong correlations to types of, to a number of types of violence right cannot be by accident um that didn't surprise me because that's I was seeing a lot of that in my office. If those behaviors were in play, there was almost undoubtedly violence going on. Um, so 
that per, turned out to be the case. This is, these are the sexual violence, these last three questions. So we see particularly on that sexual violence end that was going on. Um, even other forms of acting out affairs showed a lot of correlation with lots of violence, lots of different kinds, including physical and sexual over on this end. Um, and so, yeah, it did seem that now one of the ones that was became questioned was, well, hang on, there's like 100 studies showing internet porn use is associated with violence. How come your study didn't show that? <clears throat> there's a reason, and it's a statistical reason, not not a, not because there's not a correlation. When when a factor is pretty much ubiquitous, it's very difficult for it to show up as a marker statistically. Uh, so right. pretty much every woman said their husband was using internet porn. I think it, between internet porn and sexualized media, it was 97%. I think internet porn alone was 95 So it was difficult for it to show up as a marker. Interestingly, other sexualized media did. Um, which hmm. might be, you know, forms of lesser porn showed up with one form of sexual violence. Um, but it's not to be discounted. Other studies that looking more specifically at that should be taken as as um, a more accurate read than this one, because it was ubiquitous in my study. That didn't give us enough leeway to 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 get a sense of it statistically. So that's that's the bad news right they all mm. their their specific you know specific you know acting out behaviors were definitely associated with this um however there was some good news because there were also i'm going to actually again i'm going to do my stop share because i'll show you a happier matrix now thank you yes we <laughs> because we because that is dark news. my goodness yes yeah 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 it is but there were some factors that I also measured that showed about the mitigation of violence. So, and as you're going to know, as a researcher, um, that means we're looking for an association that's on the negative side, right? Mm -hmm. These are, we say, negatively associated. So we asked the women about their husband's recovery. Oh, interestingly, this is cut off a little bit. But this says husband um, has sought help. Mm -hmm. This is said, this should say, husband has sought special specialized help and then we just asked her do you think your husband's involved in quality recovery so particularly you see a lot of dark green on this one when the husband had sought specialized help with a special yes. presumably with a specialist in this field the violence went down there was a strong again this means there's not there's not a, it's not just random there is absolutely an association strong association between the husband seeking help and these forms of violence diminishing that, that those would not be present even seeking non-specialist help shows some good association with with again a decrease in violence so that's excellent wow. news for those of us in this field doing yes. this work we can you know this makes a difference and you know that's important information for women who are kind of like, do I need a boundary around my husband seeking help? You know what? It can mm. really make a difference on both wow. on both sides, both the sex addiction, but also on this, you know, with this other mm. issue of violence. Wow. Yeah. That, that, that is remarkable research. Um, wow. Okay. So while your study didn't cover this, I'm curious, do you think that female partners of sex addicts can be the perpetrators of violence against their partners. Yeah, and that's a hard question, right? And yeah. again, if that feels like a triggering question, yes, thank you. Takes do some breaths, and um, you know, there's lots of research that sh does show that women um, can and do commit acts of of domestic violence. But I want to be careful with that because the domestic violence really we should be talking about a pattern. Yes, um, thank you. It is more common that women would be, um, if there's a pattern, it's more likely to be against children, statistically speaking. Um, acts, a whole pattern against a partner. There are researchers who are argue, like in my university where I was educated at the University of Auckland, they would argue that that very rarely happens, that, that there's a whole pattern of that. I don't know that they would say never, um, but it's, it's very rare. Now, in the work we do, we see women and there are acts of, of violence sometimes towards mm -hmm. the partner. 
we need to distinguish that from domestic violence because it's not about a pattern of power and control. It's usually what we call reactive, right? It's reactive yes. violence. And it can be mm -hmm. reactive against the sexual betrayal and it can be reactive against the violence. Um, I can recall a woman I've, I've known and worked with who, for example, he called her a very, very demeaning, insulting thing and she raised her hand to slap him. Right. She never got yeah. there because what happened was an escalation. And this is important. And again, this is hard to hear, but an escalation happened whereby he physically harmed her mm. as she raised her arm. Um, and there was an injury that was occurred. So there's this reactive violence and it can be part of a whole cycle of escalating violence in the couple. Um, I'm also very aware of women who he will stonewall or withdraw and she'll make a grab for him to keep him from leaving, right? And maybe somebody gets hurt in that or maybe that es again causes this escalation. And so we are aware, particularly in that early recovery period when things are really tough and there's a lot of hard emotions and I haven't gotten really good at stabilizing myself, grounding myself. Um, and maybe he's going through some stuff related to early recovery and he's angrier than normal. I I would like to see more research on this, but I think it's common to see um, the violence is more common than, and sometimes women feel they're involved in this. I've been abusive. I've, mm. well, maybe you've been reactive, right? Maybe that violence has been out of a reaction and it's still potentially dangerous. So we want to stop it, right? It's dangerous for him because you could hurt him, but it's also dangerous for you because you could be escalating something um, right. where you are the more vulnerable person. Usually the woman is the more vulnerable person physically in any situation like this. And so we want to make sure everyone's safe, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's what we most commonly see. Um, I'm going to talk about something too, because you have this resource I love. I think guys often feel like they are the victims of coercive control um, in the early recovery stage when she's putting down boundaries, right? And she's using boundaries. Right. Um, so I would always be curious to know, was was, were those controlling behaviors going on before you came out? Were they coming on before she was suspicious that you were up to something? Um, like, is, is that something that's longstanding in her history with other people too? Or is this really just about her trying to get safe? And I would be trying to help him to understand this really just might be her trying to get safe. And these are boundaries. Yes. And yet they feel controlling. They don't they don't feel nice. Watch Jake's coaster video. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which, and which I d always comes up in <laughs> these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my number one video on YouTube for sure. And, and, you know, and I would even add to that. Thank you, Lisa, for, for bringing that up. Cause I do think it plays into this conversation, especially when we're looking and comparing, you know, sex addicts versus partners and, and violence and control yeah. and that sort of thing. I would just add, even if, the controlling behavior you, um, w has been there for a long time. Is it possible? This is what I might say to uh, someone saying, yeah, it's been there. You know, she's been controlling for a long time. Is it possible that her controlling behavior was an effect of the gaslighting, the, the secrecy, the deception, the disconnection, the alienation um, that she was experiencing? Yeah. Yeah. rather than a cause, right, yeah. in and of itself of, of what you were yeah. experiencing. Still yeah. a reaction to, to the betrayal, even before she knew it was betrayal, because women exactly. frequently are, something's wrong here, and trying to course correct the relationship before right. she even right. knows. Yeah, right. absolutely. So we would be exploring that. Yeah. Right. And, you know, one other thought I had, because I do think it's so important that that um, aspect of the definition that's honing in on this is a pattern, right? This is a pattern. Yeah. This isn't one reaction. And um, as you know, I, I see lots of couples. I've I've worked, you know, hundreds of couples. I don't even know how many I could put on one hand the number of times I have encountered a situation where the the female partner was had a pattern of abuse right like it, i have encountered it but it's very very rare just like you were saying but i also know that 
just like a partner can be reactive and there can be something out of character. It's not a character, a logical abuse issue right. that can happen with, with males too. And so we're, we're, you know, I'm always trying to parse that out. Is this a pattern or was this, my goodness, you were both heated. You were both reactionary. Your worlds had just blown up and it got out of control at one time. Not yeah. that we're excusing that. Right. But no. that's a very different thing than what yeah. you're talking about. How we, yeah. how we help you then is just different. And you're Very right. I, I too have had a couple of women I've worked with. Interestingly, both, both of them came from um, incredibly horrible stories of domestic violence in their childhood, right? And they mm -hmm. would actually dissociate and mm -hmm. be violent while dissociated. So it, that just tells mm -hmm. us that's information on how we're going to help her. It's slightly different than yeah. just straight off reactionary. And they're still reacting, even those women, you know, they're dissociating in part because they're they're that they trig they get triggered into a dissociative yes. place where where that's how they defend themselves is through attack right. or or a violent right. action. Yeah, yes. so we're trying to understand where it's at for people so we can meet them there and help them. But you're right, the mm. majority of what we see is reactionary on both parts. That's yeah. right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So let's let's talk about help. Let's sort of turn the corner and talk yeah. about help. So what can victims of violence do to get help if this is happening yeah so i want to say first off look if you know that you are in danger if you mm. have things that have happened that where you are in imminent danger um, you need to reach out to a hotline or a violent support service or call your local women's shelter right if if there is a chance that you could be injured anytime in the next few days right because there's there's that level of ongoing violence please please reach mm. out to support services. Every nation has them, every state has them in the US. So do not hesitate to get, I have nothing but praise to sing for, praises to sing for these people. All my clients who have gone to such services have found them so helpful. So, um, and certainly not harmful. So you can, there's nothing to lose, you know. Right, thank talk, you. Talk. Yeah. Now there are, there are times when it's less urgent because maybe the violence you're experiencing is less injurious. Maybe it's less frequent. Um, and in that case, find yourself a good counselor, right? Who knows something about this, um, you know, something I, you know, ideally somebody that understands your journey as well as a partner of a sex addict that that's always best. If, if there's that, that crossover and there's understanding of both, um, and begin talking. Now, one of the sad things that came up too on, on my with my research was that only 64% of these women, though all of them were getting support, only 64% of them had disclosed to someone. That's wow. lower, again, to compare, that's lower than the normal average for women who, hmm. who are experiencing abuse. So that it usually runs more like 70% and higher, even up to 80% will have disclosed to somebody. So, I have wondered if that's about the fact that there's more sexual abuse going on and that's harder to talk about. So don't be afraid to find a good counselor and say, I'm, I'm wondering if what I'm experiencing is abuse, right? You, you need as a, a victim to bolster your support networks, right? Um, Thank you. It's so yeah. much more e easy to be victimized if I'm in an isolated place. Yeah. Right. But if I have good people around me in places I can turn and networks, um, not going to be so easy. So find a support group. You can, there are lots of good support groups. Um, even, you know, now with social media, you can find, you know, if, if it seems too scary to get in there face to face and talking, find one on social media and start there and, and just listen in on the conversations. What kinds of things are people talking about and getting help with, but ideally get really involved in, both, a, you know, a partners of sex addicts uh, group and find one for domestic violence victims. If this is, if this is, you know, your experience that, that, yeah, this is my story. And I'm going to mm -hmm. say, I know it's scary. I know it's easier to stay isolated, but it really is worth it. People don't regret those decisions, even though they, they usually kind of come in a little bit. Mm. Now I'm talking about finding safe people. Like you do have to, sure. not everyone's safe. So, so I'm talking about things like groups and counselors. Um, people do occasionally disclose to non-safe people and do regret it. Um, you know, in the study I, I talked about friends. I, we talk, talked, asked about who do you disclose to and who is helpful. 
well, non-professionals were not as helpful, right? Not mm. so surprising. Lots of people disclosed to friends, but they just didn't write us as helpful. Um, family members, same thing. Not, not always as helpful. So, so look for those professional supports in particular. And for your non-professional ones, do be talking to people too. But um, remember that if they're not as helpful, there are other places you can go, right? Yes. That you'll probably find more helpful. Oh, thank you. And and let's say someone's listening here and they're thinking, this is sadly, this is my story. You know, yeah. I'm, I, I don't know what to do here. You know, I, um, they're thinking of, of taking some steps to get some help. Uh, but they're wondering about the viability of their relationship. What hope is there, if any, what hope is there for the couples where there either is or has been domestic violence within their relationship? Yeah. Well, and it's funny, but again, I think there's some hope in those statistics too, right? Where, where there's a real desire on the part of both partners to stop abusive patterns and heal the relationship, I think the prognosis is usually pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not a guarantee. It's not a shoe win. It's not 100%. But where there's a determination on both parts to own it and a desire mm -hmm. to change, the prognosis is actually pretty good, right? I think it's wow. important when w women and men don't hear it's hopeless because some of this has gone on in our relationship. Um, good recovery from sex addiction and betrayal trauma helps remove the infrastructure that domestic violence kind of lives on top of, right? Yes. So both, mm. both people getting that good help. Um, and you may be aware of this or not, Jake, I know you do a lot of couples work. There is even a couples model for domestic violence that I'm, I'm working with and using, and I want to get some more training in it's, it's a domestic violence um, focused couples therapy. Um, I think it came out of the US. Um, and has many couples have overcome domestic violence and to go on to have healthy relationships. Um, and, mm. you know, it is absolutely possible. And many times it doesn't, you know, work out and, and women make the choice to leave. And that's not failure, that's success too. Getting Thank help. You. Is success right right getting safe right. is success so whether the yeah. relationship heals or not you can heal right if you're a victim right. and if you're a perpetrator you can heal and yes get grow past these patterns yes yeah. thank you thank you yeah and 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 for those who do think about leaving i also add in there you know, you're, you're not just doing what's best for you. If you're the one being mm -hmm. abused, you are doing what's best for the one committing, perpetrating the abuse as yes. well. That We're doing no one any favors, right? Yeah. If, if we continue, I, I don't mean allow in that way, but we are helping them as well, right? When we leave, when we take care of ourselves, that is good. Yes. Um, 100%. all the way around. That's my belief. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. You know, I, I remember when you were doing your study, I, I blasted out your link to try to help you get some participants. Yeah. And the last time we talked, you had just started getting some results. So I, this is the first yeah. time I've heard all of your findings and I am so like, I, I'm, I'm actually really moved by the work yeah. you're doing, Lisa. And, um, I look forward to digging into that even more and learning from what you're doing and uh, just know that uh, I am in your corner and I'm here to support you yeah. as you continue to grow and, and do this work. Thank you for being a part of this summit. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you for letting me share these women's stories that mm. they so bravely mm. came in and shared. I want to honor them so and brave. I know you do too. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if, if people um, who are listening, they want to reach out, they want to work with you or organizations that you're a part of, um, let them know how they can do that. Um, let them know of any particular opportunities coming up that they may be interested in. Yeah, so I mean, anyone outside of New Zealand, it's probably best to, um, to you know, go to nakedtruthrecovery.com and and take a look at, you know, there's a whole breadth of amazing women and men that I work with mm. there. That I'm just so pleased to be part of that organization. Um, yes. I, I write as well. I write on this topic and other topics. Um, that's, that's my background. So that's beyondbetrayal.community, right, to just, just see 
you know, other thoughts I've written about this and, you know, more, more of it a little bit in depth. Um, and that's, you know, it's probably a good place to start. I, I think, you know, if you are in New Zealand, you can get to, you can get a hold of me through that beyondbetrayal.community. Lots of people seem to, to use the, the contact information there to, to get in touch with me. But otherwise, okay. nakedtruthrecovery.community. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate you. I have so much respect for you and the work you do. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. If you value the content we've shared today, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. For more resources, visit appsats.org. That's A-P-S-A-T-S dot org.